Chapter 10 A King, a Queen, and a Jackass The sound of cards being dealt by the dealer signifies the start of a new round. A 9 to the player two seats over. Ace for the player to my right. King of Spades lands right in front of me. A 6 for the dealer. This looks good. A 10 brings the first player to 19. A 9 turns the ace into a soft 20. A queen gives me a very lovely royal 20. We got this. It's the start of a new month and rent is due. Actually, it's been due for the past 3 months now. At 600 euros a month, my 400 euros that I've brought into the casino won't make a difference. A Hail Mary attempt to get back to zero. The dealer gets a 10. 16 is an easy score to bust. Murphy's Law. He hits a 5. 21. Dealer wins. And there I am. Center of the table. A king, a queen, and one jackass. In researching depression and darkness, some actual research for this book and some involuntary research by experiencing it, I came across the fact that most often, darkness is paired up with an addiction of sorts. It's like a buy one, get one free, screw you deal. It shows up in many ways. Some people resort to drinking, comfort eating, drugs, or buying whatever they think will make them happy. For me, none of those ever seemed very appealing. Sure, I've dabbled a bit in drinking, and maybe if I had the fund, I would be a raging shopaholic. But my addiction of choice, apart from smoking, became gambling. Now, this wasn't a constant thing I did, but from time to time, I would try my luck at the blackjack table. This chapter of the book might be in the running for the unexplainable award, because everything that you'll read after this is irrational and stupid by nature, but only makes sense when you find yourself surrounded by hopelessness and darkness. Nevertheless, let me try and explain why I put my faith in the cards. Ever since I turned 18, I've always had a thing for recreational gambling. Vegas seemed amazing, the rush of the game filled my body with adrenaline, a game of poker with friends was just a fun night, and overall, when I had a few bucks to spare, a few rounds never seemed to matter. All in all, up until I was 24, the amount of money I spent on gambling might total 200 euros at best. But when my financial troubles really started, and my darkness was ramped up to a higher level, I quickly found myself playing for that amount per month. The reasoning was that my last 200 euros would not cover my 700 euro debt. So, instead of spending that money on other things, I'd take my chances to make those 200 euros equal my debt. The worst case scenario was a 900 euro debt, which didn't seem like a massive change. I would still be unable to pay either of those amounts but with the added chance of winning and having the option to get back to zero. It doesn't work like that, I know, but that was the rationale. Sometimes it, sadly, worked. I'd win a big amount of money, pay off some debts, and take some pressure off for a while. That's what made it a habit. I always knew that I might lose, and that became the expected outcome. Before my money hit the table, I would already accept the fact that my debt increased. So when I did win, it almost doubled how good it felt. Interestingly, I never got addicted to the game. It was always about the results. I would only gamble when I was out of all options, and the feeling of, I'm royally fucking fucked, would trigger me to let the barrier of knowing that gambling is bad disappear. If I still had other options to explore, I never felt the urge to sit down at the table and play some blackjack. The pairing of addiction with darkness is an odd but ultimately logical thing. When you are so far out of your depth that you don't know how to get back, you're going to look for something to relieve the pressure. In my mind, these addictions fall into one of two categories, the solution or the suppression. The suppression deals with forgetting or distraction. Drowning your sorrows in alcohol will turn off your brain and, for a few inebriated hours, those thoughts don't haunt every corner of your mind. Buying a new pair of sneakers will give you a small boost of happiness amidst all the sadness, and chowing down on a large pizza with extra toppings will give you a feeling of satisfaction that you can't seem to find anywhere else. All of these don't work towards a solution, but it might help you cope. 
The solution category is focused on getting out of a shit situation, but is fueled by misguided ideas. Gambling might help you out of the hole, but it could also put you in deeper. Another form of the solution addiction is becoming a workaholic. Sure, it seems like that's just common sense to work harder if you need more money. But because of your terrible judgment, this can lead to burning out completely and frying your brain with so much stress that you end up losing the fight. In theory, this could have helped you, but due to a lack of proper insight, it just backfires and leaves you worse off than you began. It seems that these two examples are worlds apart. Gambling is always a dumb idea, working isn't. But they're far closer than you might think. It's even arguable which is worse. Gambling left me with a bunch of unpaid bills, but the workaholic burnouts I know suffered far greater drawbacks than my already empty wallet. In the end, the accompanying addiction isn't definable as worse or better. It's equally bad and horrible. You don't get to choose what addiction you end up with. It might stem from your personality. And the scariest thing is that it will always feel like the right or only choice, which makes it very hard to quit the habit. The only way I've found to battle this is, once again, by opening up about it. If you acknowledge it as a problem and let someone in on this little secret, you might be able to avoid it. It will still trigger when things get bad, but if you have the option to call out to someone and they can help, you move past it. Once things get better, you won't find yourself hitting that trigger point very often. And even then, you know what's going to happen when you do, so you can prepare. It's very important to know that whatever addiction you got as a free bonus will not make sense to anyone you tell it to. Just stop doing it will be the best advice you usually get. Therefore, it is essential to clarify that you know this and find someone who will help you out. In my case, I made a two-part deal with a friend. If I ever got the urge to gamble, day or night, I would only have to text him an emoji of a unicorn and he would call me or come over to make sure I wouldn't give in to my addiction. Responsibility for sending this horned horse would still be mine, but so far, most of the times I actually did it because I knew I would not have to apologize or explain myself. If I did skip sending the unicorn, all I had to do the next time I talked to him was to tell him that I gambled. It's a simple but powerful way of getting your secret out there. And it really helps to know there is someone who can help you carry this burden of the buy one get one free scheme. I can recommend this to anyone who is carrying some version of a secret habit that has proven to be too hard to handle all by yourself. It only takes one person and one emoji. Go find yourself a unicorn recipient. For anyone looking to help a dark mind, make sure you extend a helping hand to anyone who needs it become their confidant and strike up the same deal. As of writing this, you have 3,019 emojis to choose from, and you only need one of those to save someone in need.